Uh, I mean, here, let me post the deck first in the chat. It's kind of self-serve. But it looks like Taylor will run the deck. Are you on Alexis? Hey, Chris. Hey, I hear you now. All right, we got Brian Grant on, Quinton, John Bull. Sam said he can't make it. I'm sure he's busy over there at GitHub. Chris, was the agenda deck uh, sent out? I didn't see it. Oh, should be attached to the meeting invite. Maybe I missed the oh, mailing okay. list. Okay, I'll but, try. Uh, it's in Slack and attached to the meeting invite and in the chat. Thanks. No problem. Get started in a couple minutes. Hey, Chris. Hey. Hey, Ben. Ben, is uh, Brian or Camille on? All right, final call for uh, Cantrell, Camille, or, or Ken. All righty, uh, Alexis, you want to get us started? Sure, let me get, get everybody moving. Yeah, Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to go straight into the agenda, which is on slide five. Um, we've got a couple of presentations today and a few topics to discuss um, around some working group and uh, sub-project matters. Um, on slide six, just to welcome the new uh, projects that have landed, um, I just want to say that in particular, Cloud Events um, is a great example of a project that came about as an outcome of activity last year in the serverless working group, um, showing that the working group can play an important transitional role in helping uh, a community form around the topic 
in this case, the events passed around by as inputs and outputs of functions. Um, and then from that, an actual open source project can be initiated. And I think the lifeblood of CNCF is open source projects rather than uh, the uh, sort of committees and standards that we see. So it's really important to see living code. That's something that can be supported by um, cloud providers as well. And so well done to everybody who did that. And thank you for everybody who, who participated in the Helm uh, debate. Uh, and due diligence that was important and threw up some, some issues that we want to talk about today. Um, so here on slide seven, you can see the issue that I wanted to highlight, which is around um, the, the notion of a sub project. Now, Kubernetes has an existing notion of a sub project, which I haven't linked to here, but we could. Um, there is a proposed set of um, you know, rules or principles for how to deal with sub projects, which is linked to as a draft text. You'll see it, it's a post by me as a as comment on the Helm TOC due diligence issue. And uh, below and above that comment, you'll see contributions from Brian Grant, Quinton, Brian Cantrill, and also Matt Farina and a few others um, going back and forth on, on the issue that, that was thrown up, which is this. Um, you know, Kubernetes has grown to be a uh, humongous uh, beast in terms of its projects and sub-projects and SIGs and committees and working groups and what have you. And, you know, if it is one of the things we'd like to do at CNCF is, how can I put this, avoid some mistakes that have been made by projects, large projects in the past. And there is concern that, that Kubernetes will get unmanageably big. I mean, it's already running into very significant issues of scale just in terms of its use of GitHub. Um, I hope Microsoft can resolve those. Um, but uh, now we've got other issues like numbers of sub projects and for Kubernetes to continue to maintain progress and velocity, it probably needs to be you know, very lean and well organized or as lean as it can be. And so it's great to see uh, a project like Helm coming out from under the umbrella, so to speak, of Kubernetes and being its own thing. And I'm fully, totally supportive of that. But that raised the question, which is, you know, if you're a standalone CNCF project, can you still be a project that only works with Kubernetes? Um, and this has created a number of discussion topics, including, you know, oh, does this turn CNCF into the Kubernetes organization? Or, um, you know, and things like that. And if you've got a totally independent project, like an Envoy or a Prometheus, you know, would CNCF be as welcoming to you as it, as it would be to projects that work with Kubernetes and all kinds of things. And I think we need to be very clear with users and the community and uh, everyone else about our feelings in the TOC here. So I think if you, look, if you read the, the, de the debate, you'll see that at least those participants on the debate concluded that yes, uh, CNCF should accept that it will have standalone projects that at least initially only work with Kubernetes and that's just how things are going to be. Um, now I would like to throw this open to the TOC people who've dialed in and ask for any strong opinions in either direction on this matter. Well I, I would like to just provide a little bit more context that's also on the GitHub issue. Um, if you look at what happened in Node.js, just as an example, the Node.js Foundation decided not to accept user space JavaScript libraries into that foundation, and then those projects were sent to the JavaScript Foundation instead. And I don't think that's the situation we want for the CNCF, that another foundation, for example, you know, either a new foundation or like the Apache Foundation or something would take Kubernetes-specific projects because the CNCF didn't want to. The Kubernetes project is very large. It has pretty ubiquitous uh, industry support. And um, it is inevitable that there will be projects that are perfectly happy um, supporting Kubernetes only, at least for quite some time. Um, so yeah, I don't think we want to create a situation where Kubernetes becomes a kind of sub foundation where it feels it is compelled to take uh, take on these other sub projects because the foundation itself uh, doesn't want to.
Thanks, Brian. I agree with those comments. Um, would anyone else like to opine on that? Yeah, I had I had a comment here. Um, I think there's another issue here, which is just how many projects do we want to house in the top level of the CNC? Um, there are a very large number of um, small projects, for example, projects which which help to install, run, and operate uh, other pieces of software, um, typically on Kubernetes, um, which we may not, well, it sounds like Kubernetes may not want them as sub-projects, in which case, do we want them as CNCF top-level projects, or do we want them somewhere else? Um, and it sort of overlaps with the question of, you know, if, if projects are forced to go somewhere else because the CNCF doesn't have a home for them. Um, I'm not sure how we deal with that. And, and would we be comfortable with hundreds of top-level CNCF projects, for example? So I didn't do a comprehensive count, um, but I estimated that the Apache Foundation has about 200 projects right now. You know, that foundation is something like 20 years old. Um, and that doesn't include their incubator or their labs or, you know, whatever other categories they have. Um, that's quite a lot. I don't, it's, I think it's, this foundation is a little bit too young to say whether we'll ever have that many. I think one thing that came up in the discussion is we may need more flavors of categorization than the current uh, tiers we have, graduated um, incubation and sandbox, which are more oriented towards uh, project maturity. And we may want to distinguish uh, platforms, strategic technologies, other things compared to um, you know, projects that are simply useful tools in the toolbox. I think the trail map is doing a better job of this than the landscape. Um, but we may need some categorizations of the projects themselves. Looking at Apache, they have categories of projects in terms of uh, the domain, like whether it does builds or it you know, does data processing and things like that, which is definitely useful. That's more of a landscape uh, style approach. They have more categories than we have projects, um, just of that flavor. So I, I feel like we may need some more coarse grain buckets um, in addition to the landscape domain kind of uh, categorizations or attributes. Yeah, I think if we have anything from user space, we will be compelled to categorize those separately, for example. But, okay. So we, Go uh, on. Yeah, I mean, how, many, how many sub projects are we actually talking here, realistically? Realistically, Camille, I think that if we start having user space projects, and I'll give you one example that was doing a rounds at KubeCon, but it's just a representative example, is Kubeflow then we could have thousands of those things. Ooh, By thousands, okay. I mean literally on the order of magnitude of, you know, high hundreds, maybe over 1,000. Well, we probably can't even review that many projects, realistically <laughs> speaking. But if we look at, you know, over the past couple of years, um, we took on like one project a month. We can probably extrapolate from that over the next 20 years. Yeah, I, I've got a feeling it might accelerate. I mean, there, there is a perception out there that, that having a top level CNCF project is somehow more, uh, has a higher profile than, than having some sub project in one of the uh, high level projects. Um, and so if we create a precedent where relatively smaller, uh, and in some cases, Kubernetes specific projects uh, move from Kubernetes some projects to the CNCF. Uh, I, I think that number could be, you know, the rate of onboarding requests could accelerate tremendously. Um, and if we don't have a mechanism for accommodating them, i.e., review bandwidth and categorizations and you know just ways of managing this at the high at the top level of the CNCF, uh, they're they're going to end up homeless. Um, and I don't think that's a desirable outcome. 
I, I mean, it may be in some cases, but I, I think in many cases it will not be desirable. Yeah, I think the main source of new projects will be from outside our current projects. There are a few examples uh, where projects have been kind of spawned off, uh, like the open metrics is sort of an offshoot of Prometheus. Um, maybe Conduit is an offshoot of Linkerd, FluentBit. I don't know if that would ever make sense as a standalone project, but could be an offshoot of FluentD. So, but those are pretty low numbers. I think the vast majority will just be net new projects. Yeah, I think, I mean, for every application or infrastructural component that wants to run on Kubernetes, there is likely to be one or many uh, projects which get spawned to, to make it easy to run those things on top of Kubernetes in particular, and in future probably other uh, container orchestration systems. I had Strimzy uh, approach me the other day. Um, that is a something to make Kafka easier to install, run, and operate on Kubernetes. And you know, you could for every project that wants to run on Kubernetes, there is a another project that makes it easy to run that thing on Kubernetes. And and there are hundreds of those at the very least. Is there anyone here from uh, Apache Foundation or familiar with how they manage the scale of hundreds of projects? And it is hard to kind of understand the signal from, from the noise there, but um, yeah, with minimal resources. Uh, yeah, not well is what I would say as a synopsis of Apache. I mean, it, they've got way too many projects. They've got essentially no budget. There's nothing coherent about them. There is no TOC. I mean, I think when we, we initially established ourselves, it was with the explicit goal of not becoming the Apache Foundation. But does that mean we don't want to have, I, I, you know, my impression was that we didn't want to become the Apache Foundation in the, we felt that the, they had overdone some of the bureaucracy um, and, you know, maybe too heavily standardized parts of their process. Do we, are we, do we not want to grow to have a lot of projects also to just avoid becoming like the Apache Foundation? Because I mean, you, to point. you know, because like, look, cloud, like cloud native, I think we all believe is the future of computing in a big way. And that means that there's going to be a ton. And, and frankly, everyone builds open source software now, like even more than when the Apache Foundation started up. So there's going to be a ton of potential applicable projects. And I, I mean, I don't think we will scale to having the TOC you know, hand evaluate every single thing that wants to join um, if we really want to want to be the place for cloud native projects. And I guess we, we should, you know, contend with that at some point. Um, yeah, and I think what's holding that intention is that um, in addition to not wanting to emulate necessarily some of the bureaucracy of the Apache Foundation, it, the Apache Foundation does have many projects that have very little activity um, and don't necessarily have a, a theme. Um, they, they don't necessarily have anything to try to unify them. And I, I, I think that we do want to avoid becoming a, a dustbin for projects. Not that the Apache Foundation is a dustbin necessarily, and there are obviously very active Apache projects, but it also does have a reputation as a place where you kind of, kind of an orphanage for projects that don't have another home. And I, I think we do want to avoid that. Um, I don't think that's a desirable outcome, but I think you've got a fair point in terms of like, there are a lot of projects out there and we don't want to, um, we don't want to give up the mantle of cloud native computing because we refuse to accept projects. I think that comes to, you know, figuring out a scalable um, strategy for managing these projects and understanding their health, whether they have users, whether they have contributors, uh, and so on. And it, maybe we do need something, maybe not like the sandbox exactly, because that's a maturity oriented thing, but maybe like a toolbox um, for projects that are kind of smaller and more bounded in scope um, and have kind of a complementary role. Um, it's, it's also the case that we are starting to, you know, for some of these things, um, they don't, they may not necessarily have to live in the CNCF if they are related to uh, another op existing open source project, but add support for 
Envoy or Prometheus or Kubernetes or whatever. They can live wherever the uh, root, the original project is. Um, and that may be fine as CNCF's projects become kind of more widespread and more things integrate with them. And I guess, Brian, to your point, I, the, one of the questions I do have is what problem are we seeking to solve by making them CNCF projects as opposed to just projects, open source projects? Would, 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 and having kind of a clear um, bar for that would be really helpful. I mean, obviously it will be totally clear, but in terms of what problems we're trying to solve for the projects. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, carry on, Brian. Oh, you, you can go ahead, Quentin. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I, I had a similar kind of question and proposed answer, which is, I think we need to be clear who the CNCF is trying to serve. I think there are two kind of groups. The, the one is consumers of cloud native technology. And, and I think in my mind, it's desirable to have a kind of a place where they can go and shop for things and know that there is a reasonable way of uh, figuring out you know what which ones are high quality which ones are active uh, maybe which ones are incubating etc um, and and be able to you know have some level of confidence that what they're getting is is you know consistent uh, interoperable uh, of a certain quality bar etc and then the other group that we're serving is is the actual projects themselves who want you know a home and ownership and legal structure and uh, support for project management etc. Um, and as long as we keep that clear in our heads, then then we can shape the rest of the stuff around that. If if we believe that that those consumers need access to hundreds of projects, then we need to kind of tool ourselves up to be able to support them. If we don't think that that's a requirement, um, then we shouldn't tool ourselves up to handle hundreds of projects. Yeah, there are um, specific services that Quentin mentioned that projects are looking for, but the most frequent issue that I hear about is um, companies not wanting to contribute to uh, projects owned by their competitors or owned by companies that are startups that might disappear or get acquired by a competitor, things like that. They're really looking for that neutral ownership uh, of a foundation and otherwise they don't feel comfortable contributing. So in order for the projects to really succeed and have a broad set of contributors, um, they're looking for a foundation. Not, not every project is looking for that, uh, certainly, and there are trade-offs, but there are a number of projects um, in the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem where that issue has come up. Well, I think Quentin has hit on the kind of the fundamental tension about who our primary constituency is, um, because I, I, my view is that our primary constituency is ultimately the user trying to, to navigate this. And I, I feel we do a disservice to them when we simply have every conceivable project as a CNCF project and some fraction of them are related to Kubernetes and some fraction of them aren't. Um, I think that we're offering them no clarity, but at the same time, you want to give choice and we don't want to be kingmakers. So I think it is a kind of a fundamental tension that I think it helps to be explicit about. So I think it's a good way of phrasing it, Quentin. Okay, yeah, so I agree. Um, thank you everybody. I'm just in the interest of time, I'm gonna declare a halt to this discussion now. Um, I would ask, everybody to go and look at the language that I've linked to as a proposed set of principles on this. I don't think it covers all of the things that were said today uh, by Brian Cantrill and Quinton and Brian Grant and, and Camille and anyone else who spoke. Um, there's also some good chat in the um, IM window here. So anyone who's participated in this, please go and take a look and see if we can improve that language. Let's come up with a statement of our opinion here. And, and add that to the operating principles next time we update them. I think this is going to be more important in the future. I don't think it's urgent because I think that, um, you know, Helm is an early indicator of this rather than the beginning of a slew of projects. But I think it is correct, as, as Quinton said, that for every X, there will be an X plus Kubernetes project in, in, in the course of time. And that will create a slew of things. Okay. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next uh, slide. 
We have CNCF project proposals, a regular call for TOC contributors to help review and volunteer. There are the links. Uh, you know what to do if you uh, want to contribute and you're not sure what to do, just contact Chris. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have a project presentation. Uh, I need to declare a conflict of interest here. So this is a project called Weave Cortex, or Cortex for short, which originated at Weaveworks. Uh, Weaveworks is transitioning it, or has indeed transitioned it to a community-based project. Um, so for the duration of this presentation, I will drop out completely. Um, I'm actually going to pass my computer to Brian Borum, who's going to speak for Weaveworks as a project maintainer. I believe we have some people from other projects on as well to talk about it. Bob, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Afternoon. Good to see you guys. I'll just shut up now for a while. Chris, you're in charge of time. Cool. Go for it. So, Bob, <clears throat> right. uh, we thought uh, you should give the introduction. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, afternoon. Good evening. Um, so today we're here to talk about Cortex. We're looking for two sponsors to uh, bring uh, the CNCF, uh, to bring uh, Cortex into the sandbox. So what is Cortex? Uh, Cortex is a horizontally scalable multi-tenant Prometheus. So when you get this thing uh, up and running um, in, in a SaaS monitoring system, effectively have the ability to uh, provide Prometheus instances on demand uh, to your users, whoever those are. Uh, from a single running instance of Cortex, you can, uh, you can provision these without having to provision uh, Kubernetes clusters or storage or any of the infrastructure that you need underneath that. Cortex is a complete Prometheus monitoring system that is API and PromQL compatible with Prometheus. Uh, in fact, it vendors in Prometheus underneath the covers. Um, it is highly available uh, in an architecturally fundamentally different way than Prometheus. It, it is a microservices based architecture that allows you to uh, fail the components individually inside of the architecture. It is horizontally scalable. Uh, you scale this out as opposed to scaling this up and provides a value that a lot of people in Prometheus are looking for for long-term storage. Fundamentally, it is multi-tenant uh, to the core, so there's a single cohesive system. This is not a pod per client sort of architecture, and that tenancy is encoded throughout the architecture all the way into the data storage layer. And we're also cloud native. As I said, microservices uh, based, uh, distributed hash table for uh, the write path, completely stateless on the read path, deployed and managed with Kubernetes, and works in multiple cloud and on-prem NoSQL storage engines. Next slide, please. So there are two fundamental types of users who run Cortex. We have commercial service providers and large enterprises. Um, commercial service providers uh, like myself, uh, like uh, Weaveworks, Grafana Labs, OpenEBS, these folks are providing a system that is enhanced uh, metrics and monitoring to their end customers, and they need a multi-tenant solution in order to do that. Large enterprises, uh, on the call today, I saw Ken, so Electronic Arts and Storage OS are using Cortex today in order to provide uh, on-demand Prometheus instances for large Kubernetes installations or multiple Kubernetes installations. So these are the two types of users that we've identified who are currently running Cortex today. Next slide. So the problems that Cortex solves uh, is fundamentally the same for these two types of, of users. Uh, if you want to run uh, large installations of, of Prometheus, uh, your choices are to either manage thousands of Prometheus instances, and, and operationally that's hard from a storage and infrastructure standpoint. Long-term storage is a, is a fundamental source of value that, that uh, users need out of uh, their Prometheus instances, and Prometheus itself does not provide that gracefully. For the enterprise, having uh, a, provide a global query view as an alternative to the Prometheus Federation story is, is super compelling, and having an alternative to the Prometheus run two of everything everywhere uh, for high availability is also very nice. So the architectural decisions that uh, came out of Cortex uh, were, were based in these motivations. Brian, on to you. Next slide, please. Hi. Um, yeah, so we, we put up some uh, uh, logos here of the um, people on the left who have gotten involved in 
the code and in um, running Cortex. Uh, so uh, uh, Bob is from uh, Fresh Tracks, which is a company doing machine learning with metrics. Uh, I'm from Weaveworks, uh, using it as a part of our um, monitoring and metric solution. Uh, we have Grafana Labs using it in quite a similar way. Uh, Electronic Arts is an interesting one. They are not intending to um, uh, sell the, the, the thing externally like the rest of the people I just mentioned, but uh, use it internally. Anyway, this is just a, a flavor uh, on the screen of a bunch of people uh, either as end users or as uh, people adopting the project uh, from a development point of view. And, uh, and we think in aggregate, um, there's about 60 million time series being uh, gathered by all these uh, different people in, in real time. Um, so that's, that's that slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to spend a minute on the uh, alternatives. Um, you know, where does, where does Prometheus kind of sit against, uh, uh, if you like, the competition? Um, so some, some that you might uh, consider in this space, InfluxDB, um, which is, uh, is, is a, a very big and powerful uh, database for multiple kinds of data. We, so the Cortex is, is more focused on the Prometheus problem of, of time series and with a much more powerful um, query language for doing that. Uh, Thanos, very recent, uh, project come on the horizon um, is is same kind of uh, problem as as uh, sorry same problem space as cortex but solving it in a different way um, in much more uh, how would I say it, it's it's about running well let's not get into the details anyway it takes a different set of decisions about how to um, uh, how to solve the problem. Uh, and we think Cortex is much more manageable. Um, a couple more on there. I guess we might uh, leave them to the um, uh, questions phase rather than getting into all the details right now. Um, next screen. Next slide, please. Uh, Tom, do you want to just review the history of the project? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Brian. Hello everyone, I'm Tom, uh, one of the original authors of Cortex uh, over two years ago and now at Grafana Labs running it, uh, running it there. So project started two years ago at Weaveworks. Um, we did a very rush sprint to get it ready for PromCon 2016 and had it launched and, and gave a demo. We then spent the next few months um, making it more production ready and launched it into production uh, with a few customers. Um, we added uh, support for recording rules, alerts, really kind of fleshed out the rest of the features to make it fully uh, feature complete. And then since then have focused on broadening its applicability. So we've added support for Google Bigtable. Um, we've added support for Apache Cassandra, so you can run it on premise. And we've been focusing on building out the community, working with Bob, working with um, Ken over at EA, and generally trying to build a bit more of a community around this um, and you know, improve the software. Next slide, please. On the community, um, we are actually on 31 contributors now. Um, so it's still relatively small, uh, spanning around six companies. Uh, Code tool licenses Apache 2. And there's a good cadence of PRs and uh, a nice Slack channel that we all kind of chat on pretty regularly. Um, reviews are happening, bugs are getting fixed. Generally pretty healthy, I'd say. Um, of the people you saw on the adopters slide, we know four are, are definitely in production and three of them are, are kind of in the early stages of going into production. Uh, in February, the community effort uh, sort of kicked off in earnest. We started a community mailing list um, and, and it's led to this, uh, to this outcome here. Um, Brian and uh, the chaps at Weaveworks have, have, have drafted a, a governance process based on CNI, uh, which I believe is uh, very close to being merged as a PR. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the questions we foresaw was what's the relationship between Cortex and Prometheus? 
Well, uh, as, as uh, Bob covered, Cortex is API compatible. The two original authors, myself and Julius, are also Prometheus developers. Uh, and a lot of the code in Cortex is, is just Prometheus code. We vendor it as a library. We have up, you know, upstream various fixes, the whole of the remote write API, remote read API as well. In Prometheus was, was more or less motivated by Cortex. Um, we did discuss upstreaming Cortex into the Prometheus org um, about a year ago, um, but the Prometheus team decided against it. I was part of that decision. Um, Long-term storage is explicitly a non-goal of Prometheus. Um, the Prometheus team has limited uh, bandwidth to deal with newer, newer projects and, and they really don't want to be kingmakers. And they thought the implicit uh, blessing of adding Cortex to the organization might put off other projects. Um, that's why we're here. That's why we think the CNCF sandbox uh, might be that right balance. Next slide, please. I think back to Brian as well. Uh, yeah, so um, why are we asking to enter the, the CNCF sandbox? Uh, uh, yeah, fundamentally to, to put Cortex on neutral ground uh, between contributor companies, um, some of whom, whom are, are natural competitors in the business market, but we all get on very well, but it would be good to have that basis. Um, growing the Prometheus ecosystem um, and uh, the affinity with the CNCF technologies that, that you know, it is, it is um, uh, built to be run with Kubernetes. Um, and uh, we instrument it with with Jaeger. You know, there's there's a bunch of uh, kind of synergies there that that uh, things all fit together. So um, that's our presentation. Um, questions, please. Do you have a more detailed comparison with the other uh, systems? Thanos is brand new, so maybe not that one, but. Um... Do you have more detail on your site or somewhere else? Um, no, uh, I think that the a lot of so the the influx DB comparison you could certainly read on the Prometheus site um, uh, with the possible wrinkle that the the influx DB's uh, high availability and scaling features are really only available in the commercial version. Cortex is fully open source. Um, uh, we can certainly take that away as a as an ask to um, put more detail. T yeah, Tim Tim Bauer is is a pretty new small scale project, really. M M three DB probably very interesting. Again, quite newly announced. Uh, it's using a lot of the same um, ideas, like the so called guerrilla compression things like that as Prometheus and, and Cortex. Um, uh, it's explicitly aiming to be a highly scalable database. Um, yeah, well, I think one of the, the fundamental differences between Cortex and, and the rest of the, the players in the space is, is, is the multi-tenancy, uh, the ability to uh, host uh, multiple segregated users in the same instance of Cortex. So does it have its own uh, authentication and authorization mechanism to support that? Uh, a lot of that is uh, bring your own, uh, depending on the application of the, the end user as they need it and how to apply. Uh, uh, fundamentally within the architecture, uh, you provide your tenant ID into the rest of, as, a, as an HTTP header, and that is um, propagated through the architecture and into the storage layer. So the, the multi-tenancy is cooked into the architecture, but authentication is uh, up to the end user. So between uh, horizontal scalability, long-term storage, and multi-tenancy, would you say that there's a primary focus or objective, um, or they're all equal, or? Yeah, they're all equal, I would say. We focused explicitly in the original design doc on those three. I mean, the, the motivation for the high availability and, and scalability is because when you start running a multi-tenant system, these things become very important. Um, and the multi-tenant focus is more from a business case. You know, we wanted to offer this as a service. Okay. And for the long-term storage, uh, like some of the other long-term storage solutions, do you uh, offer 
summarization and reduced resolution for past queries so you can do efficient queries over longer time periods? We don't, no. Um, the approach there oh, has very been... Very, sorry, go on. Well, I, I would answer that as not yet. I mean, that's, that's something that's uh, entirely possible within the architecture, but it's not been coded. Yeah. Okay, and how separate is the storage layer from the, uh, from the monitoring layer? Very separate. Like, so the, the, way, the way it works is the, the, um, there's an ingestion engine which does the, the compression of the time series into, into what we call chunks. Uh, which are a small number of K, of, um, and then those are shipped off to the store, which is one of DynamoDB or Cassandra or uh, uh, Google Big Cable. So, so that there's that split basically. That the the, the, um, the metrics uh, are turned into chunks. The chunks are sent to a store, which is itself scalable, and and there's an index as part of that store. And then d data collection is actually handled by a uh, vanilla Prometheus instance that is configured to send the data to Cortex. So Prometheus does service discovery, Prometheus does the scrape, and Prometheus sends the data to, uh, to Cortex, in effect, turning Prometheus into the agent. And how is this being used in production? I mean, you obviously had people that are using it, but who's actually using it um, in anger in production to, to actually monitor their systems? So I um, think everybody who's offering a commercial version of this is also using it in anger for themselves. Um, and then, um, and then uh, we are offering this to our customers uh, to allow them to monitor their Kubernetes, custom, their Kubernetes systems. Okay, so I mean, what are the houses? So is that how is it actually being used? Because I mean, honestly, it seems a little vendor heavy. Not, and I'd be curious to know how it's actually being deployed and used, and how big those users are. Can we can we get Ken Haynes from EA to, to say a few words? Um, yeah, I'm just, uh, just unmuted myself. Uh, so I'm probably uh, a pretty large installation of Cortex. So we use it exclusively internally to monitor all of our. Uh, game servers, which a, a good chunk of our infrastructure uses, was using Prometheus uh, previously. Now we're using Cortex to basically pull all that data up and monitor our game servers across the globe. So we're pulling in right now 25, 30 million uh, time series, and that's and that's only the, and we're we're not finished rolling out our our infrastructure for the year. So um, I'd like to think it's a big installation that we're using it. Yeah, you bet. That's great. That's exactly what I'm looking for. And so, and from your perspective, from the from uh, as a user of this, what do you see the value is in terms of it being a CNCF project versus just being a project? That's a, that's, a, that's kind of an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that one. Um, I personally, uh, in our in our in pro, uh, professionally in, in our team, we use all the uh, a lot of the tools from the CNCF already. So it'd be great to include Cortex in that sort of toolbox, if you will, so we can uh, uh, participate with 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 this project with, along with the other ones. Because everything we deploy is on Kubernetes. We're using Jaeger tracing. Uh, uh, there's a few other ones I'm just blanking on right now, but uh, Helm is another one that we're using heavy on. But you're already so you're already using Cortex though. But yes, you're more likely to contribute to it if it's a CNCF project, or uh, um, I wouldn't. I mean, we, I was I was starting to contribute before it was a CNCF project, but it's it's it sort of adds some extra weight to that for sure. Okay, and from the project's perspective, from the project team's perspective, what's the value of being a? Why does it feel needed to be a CNCF project? I think it's it's more around um, standardizing the government the governance model. So as as we have on the the slide that's being shown here, um, uh, clearly there's some um, you know marketing that comes along with that, um, and vendor neutrality. So uh, WeWorks wants to to help expand the scope of the community around this. Um, and bringing it into the CNCF will, will definitely, definitely help that. And because 
Prometheus does not necessarily want to want to touch it yet. Um, uh, we figured that the CNCF would be a great place in order to achieve all of those goals together. Hey, sorry, this is Dave from Spotify. Um, just to go back to the value to end users of it being a CNCF project. Uh, I mean, I've personally been trying to, to, to talk to a lot of people that are in Spotify to start looking at Prometheus and looking at Cortex. And I think um, presenting Cortex to a group of people that aren't very familiar with uh, this community as a project owned by Weaveworks, which is a company they may or may not have ever heard of, not being for this community, um, gets me kind of ignored, whereas presenting something as a CNCF project uh, gives me a much stronger voice at the table. So I think as far as ability to get Cortex used at a company that's kind of slowly moving into the space, but not uh, already ingrained in it, uh, there's a lot of value in it being a CNCF project as opposed to a project owned by a company like me. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you. And then from, I, I guess, another question for both you and for EA from kind of a user perspective. Um, do you view Cortex as kind of part of your, the way you think about Prometheus? In other words, does the project distinction here, um, does that help you or hinder you? I mean, I understand that it's Prometheus team's decision to actually not include this functionality, but from your perspective, um, should do you think of these as separate projects? From EA's perspective, I, th I, I looked at them as separate projects um, because they, they solve two different uh, things for me. Uh, Prometheus is the uh, piece of software or component that goes and grabs the samples while Cortex is the storage and the aggregated storage and query layer. Yeah, and I think for us, like for me personally, I see them as separate projects, but I think part of the point for kind of convincing Spotify to switch from our own homegrown uh, monitoring stack to something like Prometheus effectively becomes the same thing because if they say Prometheus alone um, has some set of flaws like level scalability, for example, and Cortex solves those, to most of Spotify, it really just means, okay, I don't care if you call it Cortex or something else, it's really just you gave me Prometheus and it's horizontally scaled. Uh, but to me personally, I can see the difference. And yeah, and that's and that's a good point. A lot of our users internally, probably in our in our various companies, probably wouldn't know the difference because they're just looking at a Grafana dashboard where the data comes from. They're not really uh, uh, visible to that information. But uh, to us who know, and they, I, I assume it's two separate projects. Right. Okay. And but the but to be clear, there is no intent to make Cortex work beyond Prometheus. It is going to be Prometheus specific. I don't think we've. I should rephrase that as a question. Is there an intent to make this actually? I, I don't necessarily know that, that there is something else that you'd immediately consider, but to make this neutral with respect to, to the underlying instrumentation of the system, the underlying metrics gathering. We've not explicitly ruled it out. Um, and it's something that we've discussed, um, or at least I've discussed with people making it support graphite as well. I mean, honestly, we have <laughs> we we have the kind of the similar conundrum to the, the what we have with Helm, where you, you've got something that is important to the project and specific to it, but feels it has a separate identity. Um, and I, I've got kind of similar concerns um, in terms of of adding complexity to. I mean, I, I, on the one hand, I don't want to force a union where one does not exist. On the other hand, I'm, I'm loath to add more complexity to the CNCF landscape. So that's part of the reason that, that I thank you for all the, the answers to these questions, but that's, that's kind of the thrust of where all these are coming from. Cool. Uh, I just want to be sensitive to time since uh, we have one more quick presenter after this. Um, formally, um, if you're interested in sponsoring the project, uh, please let them know. But uh, for now, I think uh, that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you, everyone. Cool. I'll kick off a thread on the mailing list, too, for people could ask questions, because there's a lot of questions in chat. So uh, for right now, thanks, Bob, uh, Tom, and folks. Uh, now let's have uh, William talk about uh, Linkerd 2.0 plus conduit plans. Hey, just thanks, before Chris. we do that, this is Alexis. I'm going to actually drop out of the call, because I've got to go run to a meeting. 
So thanks everybody. Bye for cool. me. No worries. All right, you there, William? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep, yep, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I wanted to bring a proposal uh, in front of the TOC um, and the, <laughs> the nature, it, it would be, involve a fairly large change to the, link, to the Linkerd project and the proposal, as you can see, is basically to take the code behind Conduit, merge that into Linkerd, um, then do a little bit more engineering work, release that as Linkerd 2.0. And at the end of that process, the Conduit project goes away and the Conduit brand goes away. And everything is now back to Linkerd. And the reason I wanted to talk about this um, in front of the, the TOC uh, is because I know when we started Conduit, um, we had some discussions with you folks about Conduit itself being kind of a top level or being a, a, a CNCF project. Um, and at the time we decided not to do that, um, but I'm sensitive to the, um, I'm sensitive to the kind of uh, possible interpretation that we're s we managed to like sneak conduit into the TNTF. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so I just have a couple kind of very quick FAQs, and then I I, I would I figured I would answer uh, kind of leave it um, the rest for Q and A. Um, but the goal basically for us is um, what. <laughs> We, when we started Conduit, the reason why we decided not to kind of do it as a, as a Linkerd subproject or, or to do it as part of Linkerd at all was effectively we weren't sure that it was really going to work. We were making a bunch of fairly risky um, um, decisions and I think there was a, a non-zero probability that it would just fail. Um, now that we're, you know, eight or nine months into it, happily none of that has happened. Conduit is actually in, in really great shape um, and the goal of merging it into to Linkerd is that uh, basically Linkerd needs a, a future with a dramatically reduced resource footprint. So Linkerd right now is on the JDM. There's lots of cool stuff uh, we can do, uh, especially with things like GraalVM coming out. But ultimately, we need to be able to operate Linkerd in a way that doesn't require, you know, 200, 200 meg proxy or 150 meg proxy or even a 30 meg proxy. Um, and like I said, the reason to do this now, Conduit code base has reached um, kind of viability. It's, it's no longer a, a, a totally alpha, totally experimental thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, Conduit goes away at the end of this. And the existing Linkerd code base uh, continues. This is the thing that's actually in production at, at all sorts of places around the world. Um, and my suspicion is that the Linkerd 1.x code base will remain uh, in production for for many years, given given how widely deployed it is. Um, it's kind of totally different from Linkerd. Uh, it's a new code base um, and, and a fairly different UX, um, but a lot of the core team is the same. The goals of the project are the same. They're both service meshes. Um, the value props around reliability and security and visibility are all entirely the same. The general architecture of control plane and, and, and data plane are all the same. Um, and uh, you'll be able to migrate. I think it, there's a, <laughs> the devil's in the, the details. Um, the, the initial version, for example, the initial version of, uh, of what would be Linkerd 2.0 will be Kubernetes only. And so the many Linkerd users, Linkerd 1.x users who are not on Kubernetes will have a hard time upgrading um, or migrating. But over time, we'll start adding more and more uh, to, to, to the project and capture all the other use cases as well. And then finally, yeah, it, it'll, the idea is that the code would live in the in the Linkerd GitHub org uh, in a in a separate repo. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going to do a, a a formal maintainer vote on the Linkerd maintainer mailing list. Um, but there's a discussion that's been kicked off already, which you can you can go visit. Um, and then yeah, if you if this whole conduit thing is totally new to you. <laughs> Uh, here's the here's the repo. And at this point, I would like to open it up for questions. Yeah, I guess you, know, William. I, I both appreciate the the notion that Conduit was originally asked, um, you know, about its perspective or, or you know the the maintainer's perspective and in coming into the CNCF and some. In many respects, like it's just sort of a, 
a natural motion to follow up on that inquiry, but but uh, appreciate you know the, the team uh, bringing this in front of the TOC such that it's such that folks don't receive it as you know being slipped in. Uh, to the extent that, in my mind, like one of the more prominent concerns here is, uh, um, to the extent that migrations are uh, treacherous, it sounds like the, you guys are working toward me ensuring that they aren't, particularly for Kubernetes-based workloads. Uh, it sounds like some of the, depending upon what workloads people are using Linkerd for, some of those might be you know, more difficult to move over than the next. Just depending upon whether they've got maybe proxy per node deployments versus kind of sidecar proxy deployments? Yeah, um, I think it'll be less around kind of daemon fit versus sidecar and more around um, how complex is your Linkerd 1.x routing configuration and uh, are you running it on, what, what are the environments that you're running it on? Because you, you can get very, very complex with Linkerd 1.x, right? One of, one of the strengths is, strengths is you can have it, you know, kind of, join uh, a Mesos cluster and a Kubernetes cluster and a, you know, and a Nomad cluster all together into kind of this unified, you know, service discovery framework. And that'll be, I think those super complex situations will be the hardest to migrate over because we want to be able to support all those environments. The easiest stuff to migrate over will be like, oh, we're using, uh, we're using Linkerd on Kubernetes and we're not doing anything that's, that's particularly crazy. And we have kind of an engineering goal. We have this thing, if you, if you search for the Linkerd consolidated Kubernetes config, you'll see this giant uh, you know, YAML file um, for configuring Linkerd in kind of the preferred way for Kubernetes. The folks who are on that configuration will be the easiest to, to migrate over. So we have some engineering uh, kind of milestones. Well, on the other side, I think that, that um, Kubernetes users or Linkerd users stand to significantly um, have, a, have a much better, you know, significantly benefit from the much better kind of all the learnings that you're building into Conduit and the, the, really the UX around its simplicity and how it, you, you get up and going so quickly. Um, I think if we reflect for a moment, there are other projects that have undergone similar, like fairly massive architect, you know, re-architectures. If we think about like Prometheus, the TSDB, the 2.0, granted it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, marketed or branded as something else, but, um, but I view that as almost, almost as, um, you know, d disruptive as potentially a Linkerd 2.x is. So there's some prior art here. Awesome. Any other questions? We have a few minutes. Any other comments from the community or TOC members? Um, so are we going to, what is the process for this, Chris? Are we going to have a uh, so, proposal or are we going to have just a vote on the mailing list? So uh, my feeling is, you know, we always kind of defer to our projects in terms of how they structure sub projects and so on. So um, if there was no strong opposition from the TOC today on the call, I was just going to let that proceed and, and kind of go on uh, in doing what it's outlined today. I don't think we need to do a full official vote to uh, bless conduit in as a Yeah, I mean, I feel that this is really mm -hmm. dirty project team effectively. This is not so I, I've got no problem. Yeah, yeah. I also have no problem. I actually view this as a really good thing at responding to the needs of users becoming in some sense more cloud native. Um, as was pointed out, it's kind of similar to transitions other projects have made, uh, whether it's, you know, TSDB yep. 2.0 or fluent bit uh, as a follow on. I, I think it's a good thing. Cool. So we'll, we'll take that as a blessing. I mean, just to just yeah. to reiterate real quick, I mean, one of the one of the immediate concerns that was voiced in the community when Conduit was initially announced um, this last, uh, well, not this last KubeCon, the one before, um, was you know some people interpreted that as well, you know, there goes Linkerd, and and you know there goes the maintenance and support, and and just sort of the implicit um, acknowledgement that that announcement 
made around the deprecation of Linkerd. So I think for the, and there, there's a, any number of large users of Linkerd who, um, who now will, you know, assuming this goes forward, they'll receive a much improved uh, feeling. Yeah, yeah that, that fact yeah. is definitely not, not lost on this, Lee. Awesome. That's about uh, wraps up uh, for time. So uh, thanks again, William, for presenting and thank you everyone for your time. So take care all. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yep. Thanks. thanks. Bye.